The History of the Peloped Line Apollo, Apollo, Lord of the Ways, my ruin, where have you led me at last? What house is this? The house of the Atreidae. If you understand not that, I can tell you, and so much at least is true. No, but a house that God hates, guilty within of kindred bloodshed, torture of its own, the shambles for men's butchery, the dripping floor. The stranger is keen-scented, like some hound upon the trail of blood that leads her to discovered death. Behold there the witnesses to my faith. The small children will wail for their own death and the flesh roasted that their father fed upon. Frank Herbert's Dune series is a veritable melange of mythology, folklore, language and culture from all over the world. The story of Paul Moadi Betrides and his family, however, owes more to one particular set of tales from Greek mythology than any other. The family name Atreides refers to individually either of the two sons of Atreus, namely Agamemnon the king of Mycenae and his brother Menelaus the king of Sparta. Together the brothers are known as the Atreidae. This family, genealogically speaking, are known as the Pelopids, named for the line of descent from Pelops, son of Tantalus, and namesake of the Peloponnese, the large southern peninsula in Greece which he is said to have conquered. It is in this region of Greece that the Mycenaean civilization arose, arguably the first major civilization of Europe. This particular family is associated with familial homicide, and we often hear of the curse of the house of Atreus. Several attributes of different members of the Pelopids are overlaid upon Paul Atreides, his family, and other characters in the Dune series. Events that occur in the history of the Pelopids overlap events in the Dune series. Additionally, a number of tangential myths relating to the Trojan War and the Theban line also apply to the Atreides family and the wider Dune universe. Paul Atreides is Frank Herbert's catastrophic hero, though to many readers who do not get past the first Dune novel, this is lost upon them. Commentators on Dune suggest that we are deceived by Herbert in Dune, and the real nature of his dangerous hero is only revealed to us in Dune Messiah. This is not actually true, and Frank Herbert gives us many clues as to the nature of his Kwisatz Satarak. One of the biggest clues he gives us is Paul's family name, Atreides. This name is loaded with meaning and should point the reader to certain stories which should suggest things may not bode well. To better understand Paul and the Atreides family, as well as the use of these myths by Frank Herbert in the Dune series, let's take a brief look at the genealogy of the Pelopids and the mythical stories that surround them. Tantalus The Pelopids are named for Pelops, but to know this family properly we have to take a look at his father, Tantalus, king of Lydia, also sometimes considered as the king of Argos, Corinth and Paphlagonia. Like all myths, there are different versions to the tale of Tantalus. In some versions of the myth his mother was Pluto, the daughter of the titans Cronus and Rhea, whilst in other versions his mother was the daughter of Oceanus and Tethys. Tantalus's father, depending on which variant of the myth we look at, was either Zeus himself or Tomolus, a mythical king of Lydia. Tantalus had three children by his wife, and they were called Pelops, Broteus, and Niobe. There are a number of candidates as to who may have been the wife of Tantalus. Sources show us that we can consider the following as wives to Tantalus, and therefore the matriarch of the Pelopid line. The first of these two candidates were both daughters of river gods, or Potomai, namely Eurynassa, the daughter of Pactolus, and Eurythemista, daughter of Xanthus, which was another name for Scamander, the personification of the river at Troy. The other possible candidates included Clytia, daughter of Amphidamantes, and Deung, who was one of the Hyades and a daughter of Plione. There is also a version of the story where Pelops was a bastard and not the son of Tantalus, and another where he is actually the son of the titan Atlas 
and the nymph Linus. Tantalus is famous for being one of a very small number of individuals who have a very personal and particular torment created for them in Tartarus. Like Hades, Tartarus is both a personification and a place, although its locus is inside Hades. Tartarus's inmates include the likes of the Titans, Ixion, Sisyphus, Salmonius, Titius, the Danaids, and of course Tantalus himself. The library of Greek mythology attributed to the Athenian Apollodorus, and which is the oldest extant work of Greek mythography, describes Tartarus as follows. A place of infernal darkness in Hades, as distant from the earth as the earth from the sky. So what was it that Tantalus did that so offended the gods? There were in fact three crimes committed by the king of Lydia. For some time, Tantalus was a boon companion of Zeus, and was invited to dine with the Olympians, eating nectar and ambrosia, the food and drink of the gods. The first of Tantalus's crimes was sharing this divine food and drink with his mortal friends. The second of his crimes, however, becomes a bit of a recurring motif within the Pelopid line, and is in itself a recurring story in Greek mythology, as we shall see later. Having invited the gods to a feast, Tantalus realised he hadn't sufficient food to feed his Olympian guests. For whatever reason given, whether it was to test the prescience of the gods, or to simply cover up the fact that his larder was insufficient for the meal, he killed his son Pelops, chopped him up, mixed his flesh with the food for the gods, and placed it in front of them. This crime has a parallel to the story of the fifty sons of Lycaon, who tried to feed their brother Nyctimus to Zeus. Almost all of the gods were aware of what he had done, and were, in a sense, waiting to see how things played out. The goddess Demeter, however, was not herself, and was in fact deeply distressed over the kidnapping of her daughter Persephone by Hades. Before any of the gods could stop her, she absent-mindedly munched on some of the meal, in particular Pelops's left shoulder. Tantalus's third crime was that of theft, concealment, and then perjury under sacred oath to Zeus. During Zeus's infancy, a golden mastiff was created by Hephaestus as a gift to Rhea to watch over the baby god. In one version of the myth, this golden dog was stolen by Pandarius, the son of Merops, and brought to Tantalus on Mount Sipolis for safekeeping, whilst in another version, their roles were reversed, and it was Tantalus that stole the dog. When Pandarius returned for the hound, Tantalus swore an oath by Zeus's name that he knew nothing of the matter. It was this oath that drew the attention of the gods, and after the rescue of the dog by Hermes, Zeus destroyed both men, turning Pandarius to stone and killing Tantalus personally. For his particular crimes, Tantalus was condemned for eternity to abide in Tartarus, and his torment has given us the verb tantalize. His punishment was as follows. To have a stone suspended over him, and remain perpetually in a lake, seeing at either side of his shoulders fruit-laden trees growing by its bank. The water grazes his chin, but when he wants to drink from it, the water dries up, and when he wants to feed from the fruit, the trees and their fruits are raised by winds as high as the clouds. Pelops Tantalus's crimes, however, were not the source of the curse of the house of Atreus. In fact, the gods actually brought Pelops back to life. Zeus ordered Hermes to collect all the pieces of Pelops and to place them in a cauldron where they were boiled. Clotho, one of the Mori, or Fates, reassembled the pieces while Demeter provided Pelops with a new silver shoulder to replace the one she ate. Life was finally breathed back into Pelops by Rhea, and he emerged from the cauldron exuding radiant beauty, causing Poseidon to fall in love with him. In some versions of the story, Pelops was taken to Olympus to be a boon companion to Poseidon, and in others, Poseidon gave Pelops a magical winged chariot that could run across the sea without wetting its axles. The source of the curse of the house of Atreus, as it is known, was actually a curse put upon Pelops by Myrtilus, a son of Hermes and the charioteer of King Oanimaeus of Pisa and Elis, 
which are in the northwestern Peloponnese. It was said King Oanimaeus lusted after his own daughter Hippodomea, and because of this, he had been warned in an oracle that he would be killed by whoever married her. In order to deal with the problem created by the oracle, and because of Hippodomea's refusal to sleep with him, Oanimaeus offered his daughter's hand in a contest to any suitors. The contest involved the suitor in question taking his daughter in their chariot and racing as far as Poseidon's altar on the Isthmus of Corinth. If the suitors stayed ahead of Oanimaeus, they won Hippodamia as their bride, but if Oanimaeus caught up with the suitor, he killed them. This was an unfair contest, however, as Oanimaeus possessed magical weapons as well as the horses Scylla and Harpina, which were provided to him by the divine providence of Ares, the god of war. Given this advantage in the race, King Oanimaeus had defeated twelve, and some say thirteen suitors, and kneeled their heads to the gates of his palace. Pelops having heard of the contest journeyed to Pisa in his magical chariot, in order to try to win Hippodamea's hand in the race. Whenever Hippodamea saw Pelops's radiant beauty for the first time, she immediately fell in love with him. Fearing Pelops would be killed by her father, Hippodamea begged Myrtilus to help Pelops. In some versions of the story, Myrtilus, who was also in love with Hippodamea, was a son of Hermes, whilst in others he was the charioteer of King Oanimaeus. Again, in another version, it was Pelops who enlisted Myrtilus' help and promised him a night with Hippodamea in return. In order to please Hippodamea, Myrtilus tampered with King Oanimaeus' chariot, in some versions of the story by inserting pins made of wax into the axles, while in others he simply failed to insert the pins into the axles of the wheels. His act of sabotage caused Oanimaeus to crash during the race, becoming entangled in the reins. As he was dragged to his death, Oanimaeus realised what Myrtilus had done and why, and cursed his charioteer that he die by the hands of Pelops. Following the race, Pelops married Hippodamia and became the king of Pisa and Elis. Shortly afterwards, however, when in the countryside at Cape Gerestus, and while Pelops was fetching water, Myrtilus attempted to rape Hippodamia. In the other version of the story, Myrtilus reminded Pelops of his promise that the charioteer could have a night with Hippodamia as part of their bargain to defeat Oanimaeus. Either by the informing of her husband upon his return, or by the refusal of Myrtilus's request, the result was the same with the charioteer being thrown to his death. Pelops hurled Myrtilus off a cliff and into the sea that bears his name today, the Myrtoan Sea. As he fell to his ignoble death, Myrtilus cursed Pelops and his house. After the death of Myrtilus, Pelops purified himself in the ocean and returned to rule Pisa and Elis. He then took control of the region of Hellas that bears his name today, the Peloponnese. Pelops and Hippodamia had many children together, and amongst their sons were Pythias, Trozen, Atreus and Thyastes, Alcathus, and Hippalchemus the Argonaut, to name just a few. Amongst their daughters were Astodemia, the mother of Amphitryon, Lysidike, the mother of Hippothoe, Eurydike, the mother of Alcmene, and Nicope, also known as Antibia, who was the mother of Eurystheus and Alcyone. It was said that Pelops was also the father of Chrysippus by the nymph Astyoche, and that Chrysippus lived with Pelops and Hippodamia as their own son. Laius, the father of Oedipus, was in exile from Thebes and staying at the court of Pelops. He fell in love with the boy Chrysippus, teaching him the art of charioteering, and eventually kidnapped Chrysippus, with whom he fled to Thebes. Pelops raised his army and pursued Laius to Thebes, and in one version of the story he found Laius already secured by his sons Atreus and Thyestes, with Chrysippus safe. Pelops pardoned Laius, realising the kidnapping was done out of love and not malice. However, in another version of the story, Hippodamia urged Thyestes and Atreus to help her murder Chrysippus, so that he might not ascend the throne. She asked them to throw Chrysippus down a well, but Atreus and Thyestes refused. 
Hippodamia then entered Laius's room where he and Chrysippus were sleeping and took Laius's sword from the wall. She then fatally stabbed Chrysippus, fully intending to blame Laius for the youth's murder and calling for help. However, with his last breath, Chrysippus pointed to Hippodamia as his murderer, while simultaneously clearing Laius's name. Hi everyone, I'm Doc Sloan and I'd like to thank you for watching my science fiction station. We'd love to hear your comments and feedback on our videos. If you enjoy the content, please give it a like, and if you're a bit of a fan of science fiction, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and spread the word. Thanks very much, bye bye.